right, well, hello and welcome to uh, the third webinar in our four part series celebrating spring migration at Whitefish Point. Um, we're really happy to have you with us this evening. Um, so far, we've talked about owls, the owls of Whitefish Point and covered some hawk ID tips, but today we're going to learn more about water birds. Um, but before we get to that, I'd like to cover a few logistics just so that everyone can have a successful evening together here tonight. So there are two ways you may be joining us, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Um, please feel free to share any questions that you have with us at any time during the presentation. Um, to submit those questions through Zoom, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, questions through Facebook can be added to the comment section. And I'll monitor those throughout, and we'll work to get as many of those answered at the end of the presentation. Um, this presentation is being recorded, and it will be available for viewing once it's completed. The video will be available immediately after ending on our Facebook page, and we'll get it uploaded to our YouTube channel um, by sometime next week. So if you're watching a recording of this presentation, or if you have questions at a later time, you can always send those to the Michigan Audubon general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. So welcome again. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that highlight the different ongoing research and monitoring efforts at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory. If you've missed our previous webinars, you can watch the recording through our Facebook page or through the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel. Whitefish Point Bird Observatory is a program of Michigan Audubon, also known as WPBO. It's been monitoring and documenting the migration of tens of thousands of birds that funnel to the point every spring and fall for over 40 years. So you can learn more about WPBO, read current field staff logs, watch live count data via Dunk Do, and more at WPBO.org. So the website is a great resource. Today, we are lucky to be joined by WPBO water bird counter, Matthew Winkler. So thanks for being here, Matthew, and um, I'll hand things over to you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so yeah, like Lindsay said, tonight's presentation is just a little um, presentation on just water birds in flight. So we'll be talking about how to identify uh, ducks in flight. Um, next slide. Okay, so basically, um, to start, uh, the way I go about um, identifying water ducks, water ducks, water birds, I should say, in flight is, um, let's see, uh, basically, um, when I when I first see a bird on the horizon, I get I just look for like general impressions, so like how it's flying you know, high, off the water, low. Um, and then I guess, um, let me think here for a second. So yeah, basically, um, and with where to start if you're new into looking at water birds in flight, um, honestly, go down to your local park and look for, you know, mallards. It sounds silly to say that, um, but start with the basics, start with your mallards and anything you can find pretty easily. Um, Whitefish Point's a really nice birding spot for sure. Um, but a lot of the ducks we see here are at fairly long ranges. Um, and you'll need, in most cases, you'll need optics like binoculars and a spotting scope. Um, so for those of you out there just getting started, keep it simple and keep it easy um, and get familiar with your common ducks like mallards, uh, geese, things of that nature. Um, all right, you can go to the next one. So um, a good one that I like, a good reference that I used actually is a book called uh, The Peterson uh, Reference Guide to Sea Watching. It's, I, I like to call it my holy grail of books. Um, I'm a really visual person, as you might guess, <laughs> looking at birds all day. Um, so for me, looking at pictures of ducks in flight that are they're actual pictures that people have taken, they're not like an artist's drawing. So they're really, really real um, and reflect basically what you're gonna be looking at every day. Uh, they go into little descriptions of, you know, 
flight style of each duck and this and that. Kind of like what we're going to be talking about actually tonight. All right, next one. Cool. So, um, yeah, basically, um, yeah, how do you start identifying water birds or duck in flight? Um, I guess the first thing I look for, like I said before, is just your first like, your general impression. Uh, for me, I've been doing it a little while, so I, I know it sounds kind of crazy to say, but I go with my gut reaction, my first gut feeling, and basically, I would say 98% of the time that I'm right on that. Uh, once you start overthinking it, um, it gets messy. Then you start thinking, oh, it could be this or it could be that. Uh, so uh, once you get a little confidence going, uh, just go with it because it's gonna you're gonna be right more often than not. Um, so yeah, look for flock structure. Basically, is is it a is it more of a line uh, or is it more of a clump of ducks? Uh, scoters, generally speaking, uh, form fairly clean lines, um, whereas some of your other ducks, more your dabblers, typically uh, will be clumpier. Um, there is a lot of gray area in this, of course. Um, it just depends on, I mean, it can depend on weather conditions and which way the wind's blowing and this and that. So there's a lot of variability. Uh, but basically, different types of ducks kind of have their way of flying. Um, some are more species specific, like mainly white winged scoters will fly with other white winged scoters. Um, whereas your dabblers, like your mallards, black ducks, uh, pintails, stuff like that, those typically are happier mixing all together, which can be actually pretty fun um, to pick through one of those flocks. So um, I think that covers it for that slide. Uh, so again, a little more on flight style, I guess. Uh, you're looking at, we said, flock structure. And then we're also looking at um, the individual birds, how they're flying. Um, the wing beats can tell you a lot. Uh, or is it a fast wing beat? Is it a slow wing beat? You know, is it medium? Um, is, is is it like deep wing beat or shallower? Um, just little nuances, little things like that. Uh, the more ducks you look at, you'll start to pick up on it more and more. It's a lot to take in in the very beginning though. Uh, so like I say, go down to your local pond and look at the mallards. Alrighty, next one. Um, yeah, again, general size and shape um you're just looking at the individual bird at this point uh is it does it look bulky does it have like maybe a pot belly look do its feet stick out really far behind it do they trail behind it uh how is it holding its head in flight um that's a big one especially for uh your loons which we should hopefully get to here later on um but yeah, so just stuff like that. It's it's physical appearance in flight. Cause you know, sometimes you'll get uh some scoters that fly by oh, or whatever, you know, scoters or mallards that fly by that aren't in a flock. They're just single birds or, you know, a pair. And you're not gonna have the opportunity to compare it to a bunch of other ducks. So in that case, you just have to, well, you're comparing it to itself at that point or what your memory has you know, has in it. So there is that. Um, I think that does it for that one. Next slide. Um, and then just looking at plumage, this is a one, this is one where um, for viewing water birds, at least at Whitefish Point, um, it's probably the last thing you look for generally because you're, they're at such a long range normally, unless you get a really good look, um, you're not really necessarily relying on say color overall or anything like that. You're, you're um, just looking at more contrast. Like if there's, you know, again, I'll say the white wing, white wing scoters are you know, pretty easy. Um, they're a good beginning duck, I would say, um, because they, they have, they're an all black duck. 
with really obvious white patches. Um, their wing beat is, I would say, relatively slow, slow to medium. Um, and they generally, not all the time, but generally speaking, they form fairly clean lines. Um, they'll clump up occasionally uh, if they're kind of moving around or joining another flock of white winged scoters. Uh, but in the main, um, they're they're pretty straightforward. Uh, they give you quite a bit of time to look at them. Uh, you can pick them up at quite a range because they are dark um, and they're big. Uh, so that is nice. Um, and that's all I got for those guys. All right. Uh, so dabblers in flight. Um, this is where it gets a little more interesting. There's a ton of different dabblers out there. Um, so, and like I said before, the dabblers are more willing to mix species and flock. So you have a mixed species flock, which gets a little daunting. It sounds a little daunting and it, it probably is for a beginner. Um, but once you kind of get a feel for things, it's actually really, really fun to, to have a large group of mixed dabblers come through and just try to sift through them as fast as you can and pick out all the different ducks. Um, again, in, that, in this case, you're falling back on the stuff I already talked about. Basically, you're looking at uh, the structure of the bird, uh, how fast their, their wing beats are, you know, like how deep they are. Um, you know, flock structure for, for dabblers, especially when they're mixed, is gonna be highly variable. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily rely on that. I'm looking for more contrast in the size of the birds in the flock. Um, teal obviously are going to be are going to be really small. They're going to have a fast wing beat. Um, as you move up in size, the wing beat is going to get slower, um, and the bird's going to uh, look pretty bulky. Um, like mallards have a a pretty slow wing, a really slow wing beat compared to a a say a teal which has a really fast almost blurring wing beat not quite as fast i would say as mergansers um but they are quick um very quick uh also in mixed groups um you know typically you'll have if you have say three or four teal they'll kind of be hanging together in the group and maybe your mallards or your widgeon will be kind of hanging together but they'll still all be in the same flock so you, Sometimes you can kind of pick them apart like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the next slide. Um, so big dabblers, uh, which here would include your mallards. Uh, like I mentioned, they're obviously a large duck. Uh, your American black duck, which is also uh, comparable size wise to a mallard. Um, they both have pretty slow wing beats. Uh, pretty broad wings. Um, you can see them on the horizon quite a ways away because they are large. Um, it, yeah, their flight is generally generally fairly direct from point A to point B. Um, and um, sometimes they can, you know, at a distance initially on initial uh, sighting, they can kind of look like a goose, although I've never had an issue <laughs> mistaking them with a goose. Uh, they're certainly not as big and they do have a much quicker wing beat than any goose I've ever seen. Uh, and if you get a good look at a mallard at a distance, well, at, I, sh I should say it, at a drake mallard, which is the male, um, you can occasionally pick out the little tail curl, which is super helpful. Um, I, again, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that as a field mark, um, but under the right conditions, you can see that. Um, I say maybe the wings, generally speaking, are set fairly far back on the body. Um, the neck isn't going to look super long like a goose, but it's not going to look super short like a scoter either. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, I think that's it for that one slide. Um, so getting into the differences, I guess, between say mallard and black duck in flight. Um, so a mallard is not gonna have very much contrast on the underwing with the rest of the body, as opposed to a black duck, which its body is 
pretty dark brown, pretty black, um, and its underwing is pretty pretty much pure white. So that's going to show really, really well and really clear in flight. So even if you have a duck that isn't in great light, it's kind of maybe backlit a little bit, that is going to show up. Whereas in a mallard, it's just kind of all the same tone from the body through the underwing. Um, and so that's always good to look for things like that um, in between those two species, I should say. Um, and let's see here, hold on one second. Yeah, so yeah, that's contrast, I guess. That does it for the contrast, yeah. Next slide. Um, so yeah, that was the bulky kind of heavy looking dabblers, which are those are main two, the black duck and the mallard. Um, we get into our elegant dabblers, which are really fun because as the name implies, they are very pretty to see in flight. And they're actually uh, quite easy to pick out because of their elegance. Um, they're like the pintails are really, I guess, are the most elegant of the elegant dabblers. Um, they're really long looking, really thin um, and sleek looking, kind of like a racehorse, I would say. Um, they have fairly thin wings. Um, I would say a, a medium to quicker uh, wing beat. Um, and with the males, at least with the pintail, it will disappear at, at great distance, but at close to medium ranges, you can actually see it pretty well. And it adds to that really um, sleek and refined uh, profile. Kind of like to me, they, they remind me of, like I say, either a racehorse or like a Formula One race car. Um, they move pretty quick, pretty direct, um, generally taking a higher flight line, but not always. Um, and um, yeah, they're really, really pretty in flight um, and really easy, easy to identify in flight just because their body profile is so unique. Um, and I think that's it for them. Next slide. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess another way to um, to visualize them is as the great hound of dabblers. Like they're um, like I kind of mentioned before, they're long and really aerodynamic looking and really uh, lean looking. Um, and uh, they they uh, yeah they just have that appearance overall um up, up close they're really really pretty uh birds at a distance some of the markings um kind of disappear and there's not as much contrast there's really no you know white on the wings per se or anything like that they're just really thin wings thin and fairly pointed toward the ends um so that's a good way to look look for them too um and yeah, I think that's it. That's all I got on them. Um, on the medium dabblers, like uh, we got American Wigeon for medium dabblers. Um, they're a little more, their flock structure will be a little more disorganized overall than say pintail. Pintail generally form fairly straight lines. Um, and, you know, maintain that for the most part um throughout the flight uh whereas you know your widgeon kind of mix it up a little more um and uh shift position stuff like that main thing to look for in widgeon is they have a really nice on, on the top of their wing um on the inside like by the shoulder kind of they have a really um pretty good size white wing patch um, and that does show up at really, really far ranges. Um, they're also kind of a plump looking bird with a kind of deep belly on them. And you can actually pick that up as well um, at a fairly far range. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the descriptions I like in the Peterson book of Widgeons is that they're a blimp with fighter wings. So, 
so for me that sticks really well imagining a blimp with fighter plane wings um fairly fast wing beat on a and relatively small wings on a very kind of fat bird uh which is quite impressionable um and I guess their flight is fairly, fairly high, and and quite pretty rapid. Um, yeah. Other than that. Um, oh yeah. So I mentioned. Okay. So yeah, I mentioned basically the shoulder patches um, stand out, which is always a good one to look for. Um, fairly rounded head. Um, some of the stuff is is pretty detailed, like talking about head shape and stuff. Um, that gets that gets pretty detailed. And again, it'll be something you pick up on after you look at several, several duck flocks. Um, it takes them takes a while. Uh, but it's okay, you know, the more ducks you look at, the better you get. Um and it's good. Uh so let me see here. Um yeah, I think that does it for the widgeon. Okay, on the teeny dabblers, uh, the small guys are your teal. Um, they're going to be the smallest of your dabblers. They're going to have the fastest flight of your dabblers. Um, typically lower over the water than your other dabblers. Um, but again, this is not a rule by any means. There's exceptions to every rule, and ducks will break every rule. <laughs> so, um, just a kind of general thing to look for. Um, Fairly clumpy flight style, like flocking. There's really no straight lines. Um, a lot of shifting, um, quite a bit of uh, dodging and twisting in their flight style. Um, and again, low, fast wing beats. Um, your teal, I think I mentioned it, are going to have the fastest wing beat of your dabblers. Um, not as fast as a uh, buffle head. Buffle heads have like super fast wing beats, like to the point where you can't even see the wings hardly sometimes. They're, they're really, really, really fast. Um, and yeah, small, really compact duck. Um, and let me think here. So yeah, so for say like green wing teal, because the two teals that you're going to most likely see around here are your green wing and your blue wing teals. Um, the green wing teals are just going to be a really small, dark duck overall, especially at um, at distance. You're not going to be able to see the green in the wing at any sort of distance, even close up, unless you're in really, really good light. Um, that is not a field mark I would ever really look for. Um, it's more just it's a small dark duck with a really fast wing beat, um, you know, and it's going to be pretty low on the water. Uh, the amount of times I see ducks in perfect lighting conditions where, you know, a, the drawing in the bird book is is exactly like what you see is almost n never, <laughs> which, you know, uh, which is funny. Um, again, which is why I like the Peterson reference guide because they're actually real pictures taken and they're not doctored up or anything like that. So it gives you a really good idea of what you're actually going to be seeing. Um, and I like that a lot. Um, yeah, and so at a distance, your green wing teals, even your blue wing teals are just going to look pretty dark overall. Um, and there's really not going to be a lot of field marks like in, you know, you're not going to have any really white or anything like that that's going to jump out at you per se. Um, all righty, next slide. Um, so that does it for the dabblers. Uh, atheas are basically most of your diving ducks are your atheas, your stop redhead, canvas back, and ring neck ducks. Um, they have an interesting flight style. Um, they're generally not too organized in flock style, um, but they can be somewhat organized. Um, I've seen them, like when they're approaching where I'm watching from, I, I've seen them 
relatively organized and then they kind of just disintegrate into a complete mess like right when you're about to like try to get an accurate count <laughs> and so you're in the middle of counting them and they all clump up and there's like three or four ducks behind each other and you got to wait for them to pass you so you can get a better look or whatever so it can be interesting um generally speaking fairly high flight lines they take um and they do have a rapid wing beat that um i would say in terms of comparing one to a mallard it's going to be quite a bit faster than a mallard but it's going to still be quite a bit slower than mergansers or even a bufflehead um pretty let me see let me see uh yeah um and like you say they do do quite a bit of shifting in the flock as they're going along um so that's something to look for uh the thing with the flight path i should say and i this this goes for most ducks um but certainly i've seen it in like your atheist um is if it's a calmer day and there's less wind especially if it's a headwind they'll tend to fly high if they're flying into a headwind typically speaking most ducks will fly lower this isn't again it's not a rule but it's just a general idea so if something's flying into a headwind it's going to stay lower to the water in the main as opposed to having a tailwind it's going to get try to get up as high as it can and use the tailwind to their advantage just something to kind of remember there all right next slide um so yeah, they're smaller winged. Your atheas are going to be smaller winged uh, than your dabblers, which is partly why they have a faster wing beat. Um, they're they're similar size ducks in in body size, not quite as big as you know. They're going to be definitely smaller than mallards and stuff like that, but they have a bulky body in comparison to the size wings they have. So they need to have a really fast wing beat to keep all that mass up in the air, so to speak. Um, the greater scop to me always look really kind of rotund to, to, yeah, I guess that's a good way to say it, fairly rounded looking in flight with a quick wing beat. Um, really good way to tell them apart is, um, well, for the males, they have a really, their front half is gonna be black and then their back half is, belly and stuff is, is pretty pretty much white at a distance um they have a wing stripe a white wing stripe that that runs down kind of the trailing edge of the wing um and on greater scop that stands out actually really really well at um long ranges and even in poor light that shows up pretty well um Whereas your lesser scop are going to have a wing stripe, but it's going to be a lot less apparent. Um, so again, a subtle detail, you pick up on it eventually after you've seen enough scop in flight. Um, but just looking for the general uh, shape, I guess, overall is where I'd start with something like that. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I think that's that's it for them. Uh, scoters, um, again, most of your scoters are going to be, uh, they're large, larger ducks. They're probably going to be some of your lar largest ducks that you're going to be looking at, um, besides your big dabblers. Um, they have a faster wing beat than a mallard, but not by much, really. Um, it's uh and generally speaking they're going to be fairly organized flocks um i've seen white wing scoters that keep um like mathematically spaced spacing i should say between each bird like there'll be a bird and then there'll be another bird or two's length between each bird and it's it makes it super easy um that said i have seen them today with a good example uh, I saw a couple flocks that were really organized coming in and they joined together right about the time they were getting over my position and they got to be looking more just like a messy group of ducks. 
Um, so if they're joining another group of scoters, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be some shifting um, and stuff like that while, while they reorganize. Um, but yeah, flight super direct, super powerful. Um, nothing really stops a scoter from from flying. Um, it, it'll they'll go into a headwind. They prefer a tailwind. Obviously, anything migrating is going to want a tailwind. Uh, but overall, um, pretty easy to pick out at a distance because again, they're really dark. They're all black uh, with the white secondaries, which is the inner part of the wing, and that shows up at a very long range um and even in pretty bad light you can you can pick that out really well um so those are the characteristics again and it's not going to have a long neck or anything like that they're fairly compact um a large compact duck is what i would say all right next one um yeah again like i was just touching on uh, a robust duck with you know thick neck but it's not it doesn't stick out really far from the body uh, i would say between a scoter and a mallard the mallard's going to give an impression of having probably a longer neck um and that's mainly because of where the wings are placed on the body on a mallard the wings are gen generally going to be set uh farther back on the body as opposed to scoter where they're more even um and yeah next one on that um, so there's two other scoters we touched there on white wing scoter, which is going to be our largest scoter. Uh, there are two others. There's black scoter and there's surf scoter. Uh, black scoter is going to be our smallest scoter. Um, and then surf scoter is kind of in between, uh, black scoter and white wing. Um, I guess the most likely one you'd probably see, at least here at Whitefish Point, outside of white wing scoter would be your surf scoter. Um, they're gonna be noticeably, noticeably smaller and less bulky looking than your white wing scoter. Um, just a little more refined in the body shape, a little sleeker looking. Um, the head's gonna be uh, like kind of wedge shape maybe um, and just more aerodynamic looking overall. Um, and you're not going to see any white on the wing. They're, they're your, what you call your dark wing scoters um, is your black scoter and your surf scoter. Uh, the only place you're going to see white on a surf scoter is on the male's head. And when you get a really nice look when they're close, when they fly close by, you can actually pick that out um, pretty well. At a distance, it kind of can start disappearing a little bit. Um, again, their flight style is going to be, well, their wing beat, I should say, is going to be a little faster. The wing itself is going to look more narrow um, and a little more pointed than a white wing scoter. And the main thing there, again, is there's not going to be any white on the wing. So uh, that's fairly obvious. Um, sometimes they will mix in with white wing scoters, and it's fun to pick them out of the group because it, it offers a really direct comparison, which is cool. Um, your black scoters are going to be your smallest scoters, um, fairly pudgy looking guys, really short neck on them, really compact, um, really nothing that stands out on them outside of that they're just dark. Um, the, the males have like a little yellow on their beak, which at a distance is, is just going to look like a bright spot. You might not be able to tell it's yellow far away, but it's going to be brighter looking. Um, and the females will have kind of a tannish head and a black body. Um, and yeah, they're the smallest scoter with the quickest wing beat of the three. Um, so that's how I would look, pick them out. All right, next, next one. Okay. Long tail duck, really, really cool bird. Um, has a very distinct look in flight really cool look um they're sort of reminiscent of a pintail just because they have a long tail again that will disappear at, at great distance um but uh they just have a really really wacky way of flying 
<laughs> um, and uh, there's a lot of rocking back and forth with individual birds, um, really kind of unsteady looking flight, no direct line, they'll go all over the place. They'll go up and down in altitude. Um, I've even seen them zigzag back, back and forth. I mean, they might be going north, but they're gonna go just as far east or west just to get north. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll be going along at a high altitude and then they'll drop down right above the water and then they'll go back up to the original altitude. So there's really no rhyme or reason with them. Those are all really good ways to identify them as long-tailed ducks because there's really no other duck out there that flies like that. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe their wing beat. It, it's like almost like a pigeon, almost like a rock pigeon. They have a really kind of goofy flight style. Um, and once you see it a couple of times, it, again, it, it's just easy to tell. Um, I guess this coming from someone who looks at them all the time, uh, it's hard to explain kind of, but um, dark underwing um, and just really pointed. The wings are, the tips of the wings are quite pointed um, and they have a relatively fast uh, wing beat. Um, and yeah, just kind of all over the place with their flying. There's, there's no, there's no real structure to their fl flock. They're just a big mess of birds. Um, and that's a really diagnostic way to tell them apart. All right, next one. Um, yeah, more on the long tail duck. So yeah, uh, the, I guess, yeah, the bird itself, the body is really round um, with narrow wings um, that are, are pointed. Um, so it gives a really distinct impression um, at a distance. Like I said, the male's tail, it does disappear at long ranges. So that's not a field mark you necessarily want to look for um, right away. Um, if you have a good set of binoculars or good optics and a good set of eyes, it is amazing that you can sometimes pick up on the tail at really long ranges. Um, but again, I wouldn't rely on that. Um, more just the shape of the duck it's going to have, you know, um, the wings are all dark and the bellies are going to, are, are light, are like white. So there's quite a bit of contrast between that and um, that lends itself nice to seeing them, identifying them farther away. All righty, next one. All right, let's see, we got common golden eye next. Um, um, they're generally a little more organized in their flight structure or flocking structure. Um, and yeah, again, a very fast wing beat. I would say quite fast wing beat, not to the point of where the wings blur, but uh, close. Um, the wings, when for a golden eye, the wings do make a very distinct whistling sound. Um, so that's also a good way to kind of narrow it down. Um, there's some white on the upper inner portion, the shoulder portion of the wing, and the outer primaries are all are all black. Um, so it's fairly distinct like that. Um, it's it's a it's a compact duck, also with a pretty round, bulky looking head on a short neck. Um, so that that's uh, also nice to look at. Let's see, markings are um, just basically a nice, pretty looking black and white duck um, that are not very big, compact, like I said, and um, direct flight lines for those guys. Next one. Uh, Bufflehead, I may have mentioned earlier, the smallest of your uh, Diving ducks, I guess we're on diving ducks. Yeah, um, the smallest of those guys is your bufflehead. Um, they're teeny little buggers, which is fun to see them fly. Um, they, for the most part, maintain low flight lines over the water. Um, really, really fast wing beat to the point of being blurred. Um, again, the males are going to look 
uh, mostly white uh, with some dark black markings on them, uh, which you can pick up obviously pretty far away. The females are just going to look pretty much as brown. Um, again, you might have a little trouble telling them apart from, say, green wing teal. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind there. They do have, the buffalo head have a little bit of white on the back uh, inner portion of the wings where the secondaries are. Um, not You're not going to pick up on that all the time. But between, say, a green wing teal and a buffalo head, a buffalo head's still going to look a lot more compact. And it's going to have, I think, to me at least, it's going to have an even faster wing beat than um, a teal. Um, so that's how I would tell them apart for the most part. All right, next one. So the mergansers, which are also ducks. Um, so the main one we have up here at Whitefish Point is your red-breasted merganser. Um, there's almost too many of them at times because they just kind of hang out around the point all day and don't really do a whole lot. Um, but it's interesting to watch them fly back and forth anyway. Um, so mergansers generally will form pretty long lines um, when they're when they're flying together. Um, wing beats are quite fast. Um, between common and red-breasted merganser, the red-breasted merganser is going to have a quicker wing beat. Um, and that's really noticeable when they're mixed in with some common mergansers. Um, pretty stiff wing beat, pretty snappy, um, which is, gives a, the impression of a, a really shallow wing beat. Um, and their flight lines are fast and direct. Uh, really long, kind of skinny, skinny birds. Um, the head sticks out pretty far in front of the body. Um, and for, let's like, say, a red-breasted meganser, again, there's some white on the top of the wing. Um, and the rest of the wing is fairly dark. Uh, the Let me see here. What am I? And in general, the head, I would say, is held on the same plane, so even with the body. It, it doesn't droop down too much in my eye. At least I don't see it do that. They do it occasionally, but in the main, they're level with the body in flight. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, ooh, redneck grebe. A really fun one to see in flight is the redneck grebe. Uh, again, really, really diagnostic in flight. Um, they got some white on the wing, on the inner wing, on the leading edge, and on the trailing edge. So when they're flying along, it gives almost a flickering impression. Uh, a rounded wing tip, as opposed to mergansers who have pointed wing tips, these guys appear to have more of a rounded wing tip at a distance. Also, a really easy way to tell a redneck grebe is they'll hold their head, they'll droop their head in front of the body and they have these big dangling feet that kind of trail behind them. So with that combination and the way they hold their wings, they have a really arched look to their flight. They're like a hunchback almost. Um, so easy, easy to tell. Um, the flocks are generally not huge. They're, you know, they'll form lines. I've seen them in lines of say five and six. Um, and I've seen them in loose, kind of loose groups, loose, you know, a ball or an oval type thing too. Um, the, the height on the flight is generally fairly low, um, but I have seen them up medium, medium heights as well. Um, just kind of depends what mood they're in. Alrighty, next one. Um, let's see. Where, okay, yeah. So we basically touched on that they're, yeah, pretty, pretty long looking for the most part. A gangly, a gangly impression is actually a really good way to uh, put it. They do look gangly just because their feet are so big and they kind of hang out and, and behind their body um, and the head sticks out. And so, like I said before, it gives a really hunchback impression or arched look. Um, flight itself is not super, super fast. Um, it's kind of a medium speed. Um, so that's also another good way to, uh, 
identify them. All right, next one. Um, ooh, the loons. These are these guys are really fun. Um, the loons for me are probably one of my favorites to see in flight. Um, it's always hard for me to pick a favorite bird or or, or duck or whatever. Um, so I generally end up with a list of about ten or fifteen of my top top favorite birds. But uh, the loons are really really cool. Um, uh, and to me, there's really nothing like seeing loons in flight. Um, the common loons are amazing birds. Um, they, the common loons are obviously our largest loon that we're going to see around here. Um, they're, they fly in, uh, generally speaking, they'll fly in pairs. They'll either be alone, alone, singly, or they'll fly in pairs. Uh, sometimes pairs will join up. And so you have like three or four pairs. So you might get like a, a line of six loons going over, all common loons. Um, and they're all evenly spaced. And it's like a formation of uh, fighter jets kind of flying over at an air show. Kind of gives that impression. At least that's kind of how I think of it. Um, again, their flight is super direct, super powerful. Can't really mistake it for anything else. Uh, quick wing beat. Um, they often fly pretty high, um, actually, yeah, to the point of being annoying because they're really high up <laughs> and they're and they're fun to watch. So I'd rather have them kind of lower so you can see them better. Um, they do fly really low across the water if they're flying into a direct headwind. Um, and they're one of pretty much the only bird that if you have a 10 or 15 knot headwind, they'll still be moving. They'll still fly into that, which is pretty crazy. Um, uh, yeah, the wing beats are pretty shallow on loons. Um, to me, the common loons' wings, when they're flying, especially head on, they look really rubbery to me. It's it's really a weird impression, um, and it's I guess it's it's all in the eye of the beholder possibly. But to me, they look super rubbery and fluid, um, which is how I often pick them out. You know, it's it's again just a big big old bird. Um, and let's see, uh, again, common loon is going to have a big heavy bill, which you can see at pretty far ranges. And they're also going to have big feet that trail behind them, uh, which is very obvious at a long, long way off. A cool thing with them is if it's a warm day out, they'll actually, they generate so much body heat when they're flying, they actually have to pant like a dog. So they'll open their beak up. And they'll actually spread their feet open, which will give them an even larger footed appearance. Um, so their feet are acting basically like radiators. They pump the blood to their feet to cool them off. And they're also panting, so their bill will be open. And when you get a relatively close look at one, you can you can actually watch them fly over with their beaks open, which is actually really fun um, to, see, to see that. Um, but it'll also give them a, a larger footed impression with their feet open too. Um, already next one. Uh, let's see. Yep. So basically the two loons we're going to see around here, the ones you want to concern yourself with is like I said, the common loon and our other guy is a uh, red throated loon. So a red throated loon is going to be, it's going to look a lot daintier than a common loon. Um, the common loon itself is just going to be, like I say, a big bulky bird, kind of a a, a pot belly look um, and large, large headed and large footed. Um, the plumage is fairly high contrast on a common loon. It's going to have kind of a whitish look to the underwing, a white belly and a dark head. And the top of it obviously is, is black. So that all stands out at a long range. Um, they have, like I say, a, a pretty quick, steady wing beat for the common loon. Um, the red-throated loon, like I say, is a dainty bird. Its wing beat is going to be noticeably, um, noticeably faster than a common loon, uh, and quite a bit slower, though, still than a gree or not a grebe, a uh, merganser. Um, the Peterson book goes into some detail about um, telling the difference between redneck uh, loons apart from like. Uh, they compare them to red-breasted mergansers. 
I've never really had an issue picking them out between the two. Um, they say they're similar in size and maybe they are. I don't really know. To me, a, a red-throated loon is still still looks quite a bit bigger than any merganser. Um, and their wing beat is going to be a lot slower than any merganser. So to me, it, it's never really a point of confusion. Um, there's going to be less contrast in the body of a red-throated loon, whereas common loon is going to give that really black and white uh, impression. A red-throated loon is just going to kind of look gray for the most part. Gray, it's got a white belly, but that can get washed out because uh, there's really not a lot of contrast. Again, don't look for the red red neck or red throat on a loon, on a red-throated loon, because it's not like a cardinal red. It's like a, a russet, and that disappears really fast. Um, they fly with a droop neck, red throated loons do. Really, really droop. It looks really goofy. It gives like a snake le snake kind of neck look almost um, with a really thin, small bill, which disappears at farther distances. Um, but you can see it close, obviously. Uh, the other thing they do, the red throated loon, is it'll pop its head up above its body when it's flying and like look around. Um, so you can pick that up as well. And uh, their flight lines um, are fairly direct, I'd say. I, I, you do see them change altitude sometimes, um, more so than a common loon pretty much never changes altitude when it's flying. Um, whereas I have seen red throated loons in flight change altitude. Um, and um, let's see, what else do I want to say here about them? And again, the uh, red-throated loon, uh, the feet, you're not going to notice the feet sticking out way behind the body like you do on a common loon. Um, so there is that too. Um, and let me think what else, if I want to say anything else about a red-throated loon. Um, oh, flock structure, I guess, for red red-throated loons. Whereas, okay, so like we said, a common loon will generally fly in singly or in pairs. Um, and like I say, common loons will maybe be, they, I've seen them in pairs of like, say three pairs. So you have like that six birds um, flying and they're all in the same uh, plane of flight. Whereas a red throated loon, I've seen groups of like 14 birds and they'll be in this really loose flock structure, um, all different altitudes, kind of just uh, a really loose, ball or oval um and so at, at distances at great distances you can pretty much tell they're red throated loons just based on that flock structure without even you don't even need to put your optics on them if you don't want to i mean you can just look at them and be like oh those are red throated loons just based on flock structure um although it's always fun to look at them through binoculars because it's fun to see how they droop their head and look around and stuff like that um all right next slide um and okay so yeah basically uh if you want to check out what's happening at the waterbird count basically we have our live feed through dunkadoo um which is fun you can just kind of check in periodically and see what birds are being reported throughout the day um the best time a day for waterbird counting or viewing is in the morning uh, <laughs> before the sun rises or as the sun is rising, because a lot of water birds migrate early or late in the day, and quite a few of them actually migrate at night. Um, so yeah, the, so if you're interested in doing water bird stuff or looking at water birds, you definitely kind of want to be an early riser. Um, again, just to tie it together, I guess, uh, the you know, best place to start with this kind of thing is go down to your local park. You know, it sounds silly. Uh, and look at mallards. Look at all the common ducks, the easy stuff. You know, you want something you, you can do in the morning or when you're going grocery shopping or, you know, just parlay it into your errands. You know, stop by the local lake or pond or whatever and look at ducks for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then I would strongly recommend, obviously, if you're serious about getting better at duck identification, uh, picking up the Peterson uh, guide 
to uh, sea watching. That's like I said, the holy grail of books there. And um, just get out in the field, get out in the field, get around other people who um, have been doing it for a while, have knowledge. Um, the only way you're going to get better at something is doing it more. Uh, so, and it's fun to do. Don't let it uh, overwhelm you. You're going to you're gonna misidentify stuff. Heck, I still misidentify stuff all the time, even though I don't like to admit it. I do, and it's always a good learning point. So, um, yeah, there's always good stuff to pick up. And I think that does it for the uh, presentation. And I think we have a couple questions. I just wanna say thank you for everybody that tuned in and took the time on this lovely Thursday. I think it's Thursday night, possibly. Um, <laughs> I do lose track of the dates when I'm doing, when I'm counting. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Perfect, thanks Matthew. Yeah, um, so again, if you guys have questions, you can type those into the Q&A box on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. Um, so I do have a question to start you off here. Um, someone's asking in a large flock, are you trying to get exact counts of the birds or within a certain range? Um, that's a, actually a really good question. Um, obviously for a migration count, we're trying to get exact numbers. Uh, that's not always possible due to, uh, I would say environmental factors. Uh, distance can be one of them. If they're flying down in wave troughs, you know, if you got big waves out in the lake and you're, you're getting glimpses of birds, um, it can make it difficult. Um, lighting situations can make it difficult. Um, and again, if you have a clump of, of birds and there's a few birds like stacked up on top of each other, like behind each other, uh, you're, you're trying to pick out every bird, but sometimes there is some estimation going on. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's a great answer. I mean, you want to count them all, but sometimes it's just impossible, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I don't see any more questions right now. I'll give you guys a few minutes. I'm gonna gonna kind of interject here. Um, so feel free to type in questions while I'm talking. But um, thank you for spending this evening with us. Thank you to Matthew for being here with us. Um, he'll be at the Waterbird Shack through the end of the month. So if you're making a trip up to WPBO, um, you can stop and say hi. Um, as long as it's not too busy, right? <laughs> um, well, yeah. Counting birds is our number one priority. Yeah. Right? Um, if you are interested in supporting the Waterbird Count or other um, programs at WPBO, I suggest you check out our annual Birdathon fundraiser. Um, there's information available about that on the WPBO website, um, and there will be some more information available on our Facebook um, as we get closer to the event. But it's a great opportunity to be able to support our counters and our field staff and all of the research that's happening at the point. Um, so I guess there, there aren't any other questions, um, but thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening. We really appreciate um, all of this. Oh, one, one question that just popped up that I think this is a great question. How much do counts differ between spring and fall? Oh, how, you say how much do counts differ? Yeah. Oh, brother. Um, that's a good question. Um, so I'm definitely more familiar with the spring count. Um, I will say that uh, I think what I've noticed is I guess maybe a fall count is a little more higher pace. Like you have maybe more birds moving diurnally than you do in the spring. At least that's my impression at this point. Um, you're going to, I mean, you're going to see all the same birds. Essentially, it's not going to be anything different. Um, but you're just going to have more of them. So the population is going to be bigger. They, they just got done breeding. So you're going to have more birds. So, um, yeah. But again, yeah. That And you could have a whole other presentation on fall migration. So Very <laughs> true. Also, the fall count is longer than the spring count. So oh, yeah. if you're going to visit the point, it does give yeah. you a little bit of an extra, a, a little bit bigger of a window to be able to visit. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, that's a great question and something that, you know, we'll all find out more about hopefully as the year goes on. But mm -hmm. um, thank you one more time. And um, next week, we will have the fourth webinar in our series on piping plovers. So if you're interested in learning more about the piping plover, um, you can join us at 7 p.m. next Thursday, same place um, through our Facebook page or through Zoom. 
Um, I hope you're able to join us and um, enjoy the rest of your evening.